wife. Choose a job. Choose a career. Choose a family. Choose a fucking big television. Choose washing machines, cars, compact displays, and electrical tin openings. <laughs> Choose good health, low cholesterol, and dental insurance. Choose fixed interest mortgage repayments. Choose a starter home. Choose your friends. Choose leisure wear and matching luggage. Choose a three-piece suite on higher purchase and a range of fucking fabrics. Choose DIY and wondering who the fuck you are on the Sunday morning. Choose sitting on that couch watching mind-numbing, spirit-crushing game shows, stuffing fucking junk through the gym. Like in your last in a miserable home, nothing more than an embarrassment to the selfish, fucked up brats that you've spawned to replace yourselves. Choose your future. Choose life. <laughs> but why would I want to do a thing like that? I chose not to choose life. I chose something else. And the reasons? There are no reasons. Who needs reasons when we've got a head on? <laughs> Something I learned early in this job was that if I stay enthusiastic about the products I sell, I sell more and the time goes by so much faster. I work part-time for a professional lecturer. I type his speeches, but I thought he was crazy when he asked me to file all of his slides upside down in these trays. Good thing I did though. They turn right side up on the screen then. So I always do just what he says. One of the hardest things for me to learn was not to let criticism hurt my feelings, but to take it as training so I could do a better job. I'm a better press operator because I listen to advice about my mistakes. I learned it takes a lot of courage not to join in gripe sessions about the work here, but I think we owe it to our manager not to let customers hear us complaining about the shoe store. Now that you've observed what may be expected of you, what may you expect from your employer? such a bad job. Sure, it was hot, and I got tired of smelling chemicals all day, but the money wasn't so bad. Besides, good part-time jobs are hard to find. So about a week ago, some government inspectors came through. They said the plant's chemicals were hazardous to us workers. The owners decided to close down because it would cost too much to change their cleaning process over. 
Now I've got to look for another job. I know the government closed down the plant to protect my health, but I'm out of a job. So how's that protecting me? Why is the government mixed up in this anyway? I learned how we've used technology to improve the world we live in. And that's the way it should be. You can walk into any supermarket and see how technology has improved the way we live. Sure, it gives us better food, better housing, and better health care. But technology has created some dangerous health problems in our environment also. The best known of these health dangers is chemical pollution. Look around your own house. Chances are you'll find all kinds of chemicals. Take insecticides, for example. All through history, insects have been a problem. A few, like this Anopheles mosquito, which carries malaria, were dangerous to man. Other insects ate our food and destroyed our crops. There wasn't much people could do in those days to get rid of pests. Then, in the early 1900s, scientists began developing chemical insecticides. One was a new chemical called DDT. It was great for killing insect pests when sprayed on breeding areas. In some parts of the world, the disease malaria was almost completely wiped out by DDT. Right after World War II, planes sprayed DDT widely to control the insects which threatened our food crops. As a result, we could grow more food to feed the hungry peoples of the world. But after a few years, scientists began to notice some problems with DDT. They found that DDT is not easily broken up and absorbed in the soil. Instead, year after year, it was washed by rains into streams and rivers, where it sometimes poisoned fish and other wildlife that drank the water. Then scientists learned DDT in the water might also be harmful to people. Water from streams and rivers containing DDT often fed lakes used by communities as a water supply.
because I grew up on a farm in West St. Louis County <clears throat> back in the 50s. And uh, we started out with beef calves. And uh, if, if you raise livestock, uh, the only way you can make money is if you raise a lot of your own feed, for those of you who don't have that experience. And so we raised our own corn, and we raised our own soybeans and our own hay. And we had a truck come out from the mill, and this truck would come out from the mill, and it would grind up the corn and the soybeans and the hay, and then we would add sacks of vitamins, minerals, trace minerals. And we'd make pellets out of it, and this is what we would feed the calves. And in six months' time, we'd ship them to market to be slaughtered, and we'd save back some of the best ones for ourselves. We'd knock them in the head and eat them, put it bluntly. And um, it always fascinated me as a teenager that we did that for those calves, and in six months, ship them off to be slaughtered, or we'd eat them. And we wanted to live to be 100 years of age without any aches and pains. And guess what? We didn't take any vitamins or minerals. And that bothered me. So I asked my dad, I'd say, hey, Pops, how come you do that for those calves, you don't do that for us? And he'd give me this good old Missouri farm wisdom. He'd say things like, shut up, boy. You're getting this farm fresh food, and we hope you appreciate it. And, of course, I was very quiet then because I didn't want to miss out on any meals. Thank you.